Hi, this is Steve Payton from Fukuoka Jalt. We're very pleased to present here a video of the presentation that was given to us on the 31st of October by these four panelists, Dr. Kathleen Brown, Dr. Joe Minard, Dr. Christy Collins, and Dr. Louise Ohashi. Now, yes, it was Halloween, and if you look very closely, you may see me wearing a Superman costume. This doesn't usually happen at our meetings, but uh, neither does the privilege of having four great speakers from right across the country. So let's go straight to it. Uh, the recording began just after I had introduced Dr. Kathleen Brown. I uh, want to say thank you to Steve and Fukuoka Jolt for having us this evening. And I'm very happy to share things about the book and share uh, the stories, narratives of three of our authors in the book. Steve's done a lot of this work for us already, but just to recap, uh, I'm going to speak about the book, a little bit about how it came to be, and I'm going to introduce a little bit about the situation for women, foreign women in tertiary education. Joe Minard is going to uh, speak about academic leadership. Christy Collins will talk about her road to tenure, and Louise Ohashi will talk about her professional development, particularly in relation to her work with JALT. That's the cover of our book there. The main impetus for tonight's panel was, as Steve said, uh, the recent publication of this edited volume. It's a volume of experiences of foreign women teaching in Japan in higher education. And I was one of the three editors of the book, along with Ayan Nagatomo and Melody Cook. And uh, Joe Minard was the publisher of our book, who also uh, contributed a chapter to the book and then uh, two of our other authors with us tonight, Christy and Louise. Uh, this is access information. If any of you want to grab a shot of the QR code, the publisher's uh, website is there. I'll put this uh, slide up again later, but that's uh, just a quick look at what the uh, information for our book is. So I want to just look quickly at situation for uh, women in uh, teaching in universities. The title of our book includes narratives from our quarter. And this is representative of data which shows that foreign women comprise about one fourth or a quarter of the teaching force at, in Japanese universities. Uh, the data on the right uh, is from 2016. And we see here that foreign women made up about 28% of university teaching staff. This includes assistants. As you can see, this is number is approximately the same as the uh, pie on the left showing uh, Japanese women. This data is from 2020, but about 26% of the teaching uh, population in universities. And this looks a little bit at the positions that foreign women are holding in universities. As you can see in the academic leadership positions, that of president, uh, professor, those are coming in at just under a quarter. Again, this data is from 2016. One of the most common positions, the lecturer position, uh, is just under a third. And the assistant, the Joshu positions, that's where we get to, um, almost half women. But just looking at these numbers is a little bit misleading. So to go back and to look at this, these numbers again, the numbers on the right, that is the total population is of foreign nationals only. So that 28% is 28% of all of the foreign nationals teaching, not representative of the total population of teachers in universities. And so these numbers that we see this again, this is of the entire foreign uh, teacher population. Uh, so that percentage shows foreign women as opposed to foreign men. So to get a better idea of what the total picture looks like on uh, the broader context of tertiary education, this gives us a little bit uh, better idea. This data uh, was taken from the MEXT school survey of 2007 
And this shows how women and especially foreign women are represented at, at the university level. The orange bars uh, represent full-time positions and the purple bars represent part-time work. And as we can see, only Japanese men are showing larger numbers of full-time positions than part-time positions. When we get over to the right to the foreign females, we find that uh, foreign females represent only 2.5% of the part-time commu community, as well as 2.5% of the full-time working community. So in this larger scheme, we can see that as foreign women teaching in universities were much, much less than a quarter of the total university working force. Female foreign nationals uh, in these pie charts are represented by the yellow, yellow bars here. So even without referring to numbers, we can see here that at the Koshi or the lecturer level, we're still somewhat visible here in yellow. But as we move over here to Kyoju, the uh, professor, we are quite neg negligible at this level here. So looking at all of this and where we are as foreign women working in universities, this kind of brings us to the why of why we were getting together this book of women's narratives on their experiences in teaching at the Japanese university level. We wanted to put together a book, a collection of stories from women that had made their way in teaching at the university level. This quote is taken from the introduction in our book, uh, that it's a book about struggles leading to triumphs. The book is most interesting to me in that each story in the 22 chapters from 22 different women are each from a different perspective, highlighting each woman's unique journey to this triumph. Building on the work that uh, was done in teacher identity by Nagatomo and further research done by my co-editors uh, Nagatomo and Cook, we reached out specifically to women for a collection of narratives on their experiences. Something that was valuable for me as an editor uh, was the opportunity to engage with the authors in how they wanted to relay their own narrative and fine tune the role of identity in their pieces. Uh, as an author myself, this was also a challenge for me in writing my own chapter into fine tuning my own identity and how I wanted to present myself in my narrative. We didn't set out to make this book a book that was based solely on research. We wanted each author to use a narrative that best suited the telling of their story and how they wanted to represent themselves in their narrative. Uh, two frameworks that especially resonate with me are the, uh, this idea of autobiographical stories. Uh, as Stephanie Vandrick uh, writes, these autobiog autobiographical stories shed light, not just on the lives of specific individuals, but on certain themes that are relevant in a much broader way. And I also like the construct of scholarly personal narratives or SPNs. Uh, this was developed by Robert Nash at the University of Vermont. Uh, he wrote the book, Liberating Scholarly Writing, The Power of Personal Narrative. And the quote here uh, from the latest edition of his book, I think fits well with what we see in our edited volume that the writers uh, intentionally organize their essays around themes, uh, constructs that carry larger, uh, more universalizable meanings for readers. Uh, I'll be talking a little more about this kind of topic at our presentation at the upcoming JALT 2020 National Conference. So once we began collecting the final drafts from our authors, we could see that their pieces were fitting into general themes. And this is what we use to organize the book. So the themes that we find in the book are career building, teaching, professional development, 
merging the personal and professional, gendered and racialized identity, workplace harassment, and leadership. And tonight, our group of authors will be addressing three of these themes. We'll have leadership from Joe Minard and career building from Christy Collins and professional development from Louise Ohashi. Uh, we also have other opportunities to hear speakers from, uh, excuse me, authors from our book uh, speaking in other venues. I'm going to plug for JALT 2020 tonight. Uh, Yoshi Grote, one of our authors, will be plenary speaker at the upcoming JALT 2020 National uh, Conference. She'll be speaking on uh, diversity in the classroom community and uh, empowering diverse identities. I think the plenary is the supporting diversity in the classroom community on Sunday. And Avril Hey Matsui will be speaking on her experiences uh, as a black woman and her, the title of her uh, keynote will be The Changing Face of ELT, Black Women in ELT on Sunday as well. And uh, both of them will be doing other, other presentations. And then for our, uh, related to our book, we'll have a larger panel uh, of authors, different authors this time, from our book in a forum on Sunday morning, November 22nd. Uh, this group of authors will be speaking on topics such as gender and racialized identities, balancing personal and professional lives, and professional development. On Saturday night, I'll be introducing some of the constructs of leadership that I write about in my chapter on leadership, uh, speaking on executive presence, collaborative leadership, and other things. So please join us for as many of these as you can attend. We'd love to have you hear from more of the authors uh, from this wonderful book. I will leave here in our slides uh, references that I use to inform uh, this part of uh, the presentation, but there are also a lot of good references found in the chapters in the book, as well as a, a list of resources uh, at the back of the book. And I'll leave both of these uh, reference slides in. And I think with that, I'll close this introductory segment and introduce our next speaker, Joe Minard, who is uh, the publisher of Narratives from Our Quarter. And she'll be speaking to us tonight about academic leadership. So thank you. And over to you, Joe. That's great. Thanks very much, Kathleen. Thanks very much, everyone, for inviting us here tonight. Um, I'm going to share my screen if I can. Okay. Can you hear me okay and see my slides? Someone give me a thumbs up, excellent. Okay, how's that? All right, so um, there's a QR code if you're interested. There, I'm gonna talk uh, about some themes that I um, go into more detail on in my chapter. I'm not gonna present it as a narrative, even though it's, it is a narrative in the chapter, of course, um, but I've picked out some parts that I thought might be most useful to others or maybe perhaps interesting to others. Um, so, just to let you know, I'm, I'm a professor uh, at Kanda University of International Studies based in Chiba, and I'm the director of the Self Access Learning Centre, and I've, I've done that since, um, well, for about 12 years, yes, yeah, since 2008. And for the last three years, I've been the director of the Research Institute for Learner Autonomy Education. And um, yes, I'm, I have my own small publishing company as well, so I'll talk a little bit about that at the end as well. Okay, before I get into it, maybe it's important to say, even though I'm, um, you know, in a leadership position, which as we've just seen in the previous presentation, uh, might be a little bit unusual being a professor and a leader, um, and I'm not Japanese either. I have to say that uh, Kanda University um, maybe isn't a typical Japanese university. Uh, and the department I head up operates as a sort of English medium international working environment. Um, and in fact, they, particularly wanted a non-Japanese academic to head up the department 12 years ago. So I, I got the job partly because I'm not Japanese. Um, in fact, Japanese language schools were not a requirement of the job either. So this has meant I've had certain freedoms that perhaps Japanese colleagues or uh, colleagues in a more sort of uh, Japanese structured um, environment have, uh, you know, have had more constraints. Um, I've had more freedoms. 
So it's been a benefit for me, you know, whereas normally perhaps my foreignness and my lack of Japanese language skills would certainly have been a disadvantage. They've been beneficial and um, it's helped me to navigate uh, my department uh, to help us to sort of make a difference, I hope, to language education, both in Japan and internationally. Okay, so having said that, long, my experience has been largely positive, but as, as with any leadership position, there have been plenty of challenges along the way. So what I'm going to talk about today, mostly, I would say, applies to any leadership position in any country with someone of any gender. But then there are a few that, that will be quite Japan specific at the end. Okay, so perhaps the first one I'll start with. Um, uh, so this is where I'm yeah, I'll start with why I am in the leadership role. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how it's useful to understand your strengths and weaknesses as a leader, um, how to develop your personal definition of leadership, how to demonstrate competence. Mostly that is for yourself, by the way. Um, understanding leadership cultures and then a little bit about academic publishing as a leadership um, opportunity. OK, so why take on a leadership role? I think probably few academics would go into the field planning to be a head of department or planning to be a leader in, academic, in academia. You know, usually you get into the field because you're interested in academic um, research or helping students or making a difference for a quest of knowledge, all these kinds of things. And that was certainly true of me. I didn't get into academia to be a leader, um, but I'm here. And um, mostly it's because it resonates with my personal goal, which, which is something I got um, early on in my leadership career. Buller, the references at the end, um, suggests making a, your own sort of mission statement, even though that sounds a bit corporate, but a higher purpose, I suppose, which is I want to make a difference to language education. Okay, so this is something I developed many years ago and I, I still hold to. So which means everything you can do, everything you do, you anchor to this higher purpose. And I'm able to do this, I think, as a, in my role, more so than when I was in a, a teaching position. So that's why I'm still here and I find it very rewarding because I can contribute. Okay, so especially in the first few years, I um, came to my position, you know, very new, so I didn't have my allies uh, or, um, you know, my support network in my new position. Um, I was new to the university, I had to get used to that, uh, I had to get used to colleagues, new students, a new department, everything. So it's easy in that position, I think, to feel quite insecure um, and look uh, and feel like you're not, you're comparing yourself to others and you feel like you're not performing. Um, I kept asking myself, can I, can I do this? You know, am I able to be a leader? Uh, I'm a great believer in tools. And in fact, my area of academic study is, uh, you know, supporting language learners. It's, it's you know, it's um, um, language education. And so one of the things I do is to help my students to understand themselves better um, by engaging and thinking deeply about themselves and their learning. And so the same thing applied, uh, to, I think, to all of us. So as a developing leader, uh, I predictably read as much as I could about leadership. I took lots of online free MOOCs. Um, I audited an MBA uh, course and things like that. And so one of the tools that was particularly helpful was developed by Clausen et al. And it was a leadership strengths um, questionnaire. And the, the link is at the end of the slides. Um, it's just a simple questionnaire where you had to rate yourself. And I just assumed that I would score badly on all of the six dimensions. Um, but actually, I, surprised, I was very surprised to find that I was very high on two of them. And so that was number four, which was supporting others so that they can contribute. That's always been a strength of mine. I like to support and encourage others. And the other was being relentless. So I think if any, anybody has known me for more than five minutes, they'll know that this is a particular trait of mine. I'm really determined. And so I realized that these are two really important leadership skills that it didn't occur to me before. Like, I think now it seems a little bit obvious, but back then, you know, when, when I'm struggling and not realizing um, what my strengths are, Having this tool really helped me. So give it a go. So that's my first tool. So having understood some of my um, strengths, of course, I then could see what my weaknesses were. And uh, predictably, being relentless, um, I started to work on them too. 
So one of them was to have uh, my purpose, you know, what's my definition of leadership? So through my reading, I realized that, you know, someone could be autocratic, democratic, transformational, transactional, and all of these things. Um, and I could relate to all of them, I think. And the, the literature definitely says that not, there's not just one style that's best and, you know, good leaders actually move between many, depending on the situation. Um, but I wanted to uh, create my own. I wanted to sort of borrow from parts and create something that really resonated with me. So this was one of the tools from Claus and et al. Uh, and then one of the Coursera MOOCs I took called Women in Leadership um, had this brilliant activity, which I recommend. It's like a free write activity. So the first task is, you know, you just write whatever comes into your mind for a few minutes. Um, describe a bad leader, or someone you've worked with, and what sort of things do they do? What kind of actions do they do? And so you might write, you know, uh, they didn't listen or, um, uh, you know, they didn't care about people. They didn't, they made decisions without consulting or whatever it is. So you write um, a lot of the traits that you thought this person, um, you know, did that you would never want to do, basically, that you wouldn't want in, your lead, in, in somebody who's your, your boss. And then the second one was to describe an effective leader. And so I've had some very good ones in the past. So I was able to write things like, you know, encouraged me, listened, um, you know, had a vision and all these sorts of things that I realized uh, that were very valuable. So just writing down good and bad was a very helpful exercise. And I realized the things I'd written for the effective leader were not necessarily things that you traditionally think about when you think about, you know, these uh, um, traditional leaders, I suppose. And they were all the things that I thought, well, I do many of those. And that was really empowering, I think, to realize that. So the next step was to develop my own personal definition of leadership. And it, you know, this changes a little bit over time. I add to it when I read things. Um, but basically the first column, uh, these are, I hope, what I'm like as a person, not just a leader. So a good listener, kind, supportive, encouraging, and so on. Um, and then the, this column is more, things that I can apply to a leadership situation. So put students first, prioritize student learning. This is why we're here. So have this, if you're an academic, in your academic leadership, this has to be your priority. But I mean, um, you know, as a, an academic, I'm reading all sorts of uh, education theories, but one that I particularly um, have been interested in recently is self-determination theory, which is a grand theory of uh, autonomous motivation. And I apply this in language learning. So I hope we can create conditions where our students can thrive. Um, and according to DC and Ryan, you can uh, support students three basic, basic psychological needs. Um, this is something they, um, that you, we can create these conditions to help students to thrive. So competence, helping someone feel um, like they can do it, and that they are having their op optimal challenge. Autonomy, where they, they can see um, that what they're doing is aligned with their personal goals and they can take charge of this. And relatedness, which is a create, which is a supportive um, and uh, kind of um, an environment that supports other, others, uh, a close relationship with others. So this is something you can apply to leadership as well. And so recently um, I've been interested in trying to create these conditions within our team so all of us can thrive and support each other. And um, the self-determination theory.com, I think it is website, has a lot of tools for leaders. And so we've, um, my team, we've been uh, trying out some of these questionnaires to see how much our basic psychological needs are being supported and, you know, where we can make uh, changes. So this is, this has lots of tools on their website. So competence was one I actually struggled with for a little while. Um, you may remember I I said that I came into a new department and our department specializes in promoting learner autonomy, which I do did have a background in from many years ago, but we also specialize in advising. And even though it's something I had done a little bit before I, I got the job, um, I didn't feel an expert at all. It was something I know I needed to demonstrate to myself um, and to my team to show that I was committed and, you know, serious and also able to lead, you know, if I, if I could um, have this, uh, I suppose, this develop, well-developed knowledge in our field, um, this is something I could do to really contribute to the field, uh, to contribute to our team. 
Um, and actually this, this one is the thing that comes easiest to us academics. We know how to do this, right? We publish papers, we do research um, and we give presentations and we develop um, a sense of you know, un deep understanding of our work. And by publishing and putting it out there, uh, you're demonstrating competence to yourself, I think. So, um, so the tool here is ask yourself in your role, what do you need to do? to feel like you're an expert. What is it you need to develop expertise in? And then make a goal to do it. I think it took me about two years. You know, I organized a conference, I created a, a model for advising and a few things like that that were really key to help me feel a sense of competence, which then has a, um, an effect on your own confidence too. Okay, the last one to come to is um, about uh, leadership cultures. This is quite, quite interesting and maybe you're squinting here, but um, I suppose prior to this job, uh, I would have been more familiar with this quarter of the pie, I suppose. Um, I've worked in several countries before and with people from um, many different places, um, but you see Japan is down here. So it tends to be, according to Mayer and other researchers, hierarchical and consensual. So this is something that really helped me to make sense of a few things. Um, so uh, early on in my time at Kuis, I guess I struggled with a few things like trying to understand why there was conflict, or why people were so upset about certain things. And you can read more about this in my chapter if you like, but, um, and some of it I didn't publish, but uh, I went about um, and just trying to understand uh, my situation as much as possible. Um, one, of the, one of the tasks I did, I um, interviewed every member of um, the team, the, the uh, administrative team, um, was in order to get their stories and to understand how they made sense of it. So one of the causes of conflict was that half of the team were very, you know, quite comfortable with my autonomy supportive approach to leadership, uh, you know, quite egalitarian, but about half of the team um, really wanted you know, more Japanese hierarchical structure. And so the, this caused conflict. And now it seems maybe obvious, but at the time I couldn't understand. But later and through talking with the colleagues, I got a really deep sense of what we, you know, what we were grappling with. And then as a team, we decided to come up with a um, working philosophy document and a conflict resolution document. So these are in our handbook now. And so every time a new member of the team comes, um, we can refer to them. So this was co-created, which was quite consensual. So it works pretty well. So it was hierarchical in that I initiated it and asked people to be involved, but consensual in that everyone had input into it. And so we created something that was for an international environment within a Japanese university. So for our unique context, so that everyone could understand. We did a few other things as well, which you can read about in the chapter if you like. Um, just to say a quick a couple of words about um, my role as academic uh, publisher as well. So this is something that aligns with my mission. Um, you know, I want to make a difference to language education. And this is something I can do to support others to share their stories or to share their research and get their work out there. And this has an impact. Of course it does. So that's one reason I want to do it. And the other is I can publish the books that I believe in. So when um, Diane and Kathleen and Melody uh, sent this proposal my way. I, I just thought, yes, we really need this. You know, what an excellent idea to have these different narratives and um, to feel a sense of connection and support. Um, so I, of course, loved it. Usually I send the books out to about two readers to give feedback on proposals. With this one, I sent it out to four readers um, because I just thought, well, is it just me that's excited about this book? You know, I, maybe I'm just the target audience. Maybe it's the target audience is really small, but I sent it to um, men and women in Japan and outside Japan, and all of them uh, gave you know, a very enthusiastic response. And so I'm delighted that we were able to publish this book. And, and then um, I was you know, kind of flattered that I was invited to write a chapter on leadership because I don't feel like I'm an expert on leadership, but I certainly enjoyed writing my narrative and it helped me to understand my journey a bit more. So, this is just a summary. So, you know, here are some of the tools I introduced. Articulate your higher purpose, anchor everything to that. Um, get a sense of your leadership strengths and weaknesses. Uh, develop your own personal leadership definition. Demonstrate competence to yourself. 
um, and define your work culture with, alongside your colleagues, with your colleagues. And I'll finish there. And the QR code is there if you want to have a look and follow the links to do some of the tools yourself. Okay. Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, Kathleen, are you handling the next step? Who are we having? Christy, Christy is going to be speaking next. Christy, are you ready? I am indeed. Hey. Okay, let me just get my slides up. Wow, that was a great presentation. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I'm so delighted to, to be presenting on this panel because, um, you know, it's, it's amazing how we, <laughs> I think that our networks do just make the world a smaller and smaller place. Um, and so, you know, I, I've known of Joe and Louise uh, for a long time and people have, have said such nice things about you and this is my first time to actually meet you both. So Joe and Louise, really, it's a pleasure. Uh, <laughs> and Kathleen and I go back a long way because we've been involved with, with Gail before and we, we worked on editing with the journal. So it's, it's really such a pleasure to, to be uh, doing this panel with my friend Kathleen. Um, so yeah, I, I thank you all for uh, showing up on, oh, one second, that's saying it's paused. Uh, let me try that again. Um, you know, not only is it a Saturday night that you're giving up, but it's Halloween. <laughs> so thanks for coming out. That's really kind of you. Um, and I, my, my talk will, will be uh, familiar to two or three of you in this room because uh, this is adapted just a bit from a talk I, I did a year ago, um, which was just as we were putting the book together and looking ahead to the exciting day that this book was going to be released. Um, so I, I actually did a, a presentation on this topic for Temple University and uh, that was last September and it just feels like a whole other world ago. Um, but yeah, I, it's interesting because some of the things that come out um, in the, the chapter and in this presentation um, will show that there's differences in our COVID world. So that might be something interesting for us to talk about as well. Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, my, my name is Christy Collins and I'm up here in SCUBA. I'm talking to you from SCUBA up here. And um, my, my university affiliation is at Reitaku University, which is a small, lovely little liberal arts campus in Kashiwa in Chiba. And um, we have been closed since April, but um, hopefully I can get back to my pretty campus soon. Um, my topic is about the long and winding journey to secure tenure uh, because I will be celebrating my 20th Japan anniversary in April, um, but it took 16 years of permanent, uh, of full-time teaching at the university level to secure a permanent job. And so this is all about the adventures of getting there, finally. Um, so first we're gonna take just a quick look at how that actually happened and identify the two main uh, obstacles that I think were standing in my way, or at least that were, were making it more challenging, uh, the foreign factor and the female factor. And then in case any of you are actually in that same sort of situation and are looking for how you're going to be able to actually secure a tenured position, I will share with you some insider tips. So I'm going to start with some uh, biographical info. Um, this is 1974, and this is me. <laughs> so I was three months old when I went to my first PhD graduation, and that was for my father. And he, uh, he got his PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, outside of Boston. And in 1974, when you graduated with a PhD, um, <laughs> institutions and industry came to campus to headhunt. 
it's hard to imagine a time when you just you walked out of the ceremony and then you you had your pick of jobs because there were so few people with PhDs at that time that uh, you know you, you were in high demand. So it was a very different kind of scene than uh, those of us coming out of PhD programs in the last 10, 10 15 years. Um, now, growing up as, as the child of an academic, I got an insider view of how that all worked. And um, my, my parents actually moved us up to Canada. I was smuggled across the border in my mother's stomach. <laughs> and uh, I, I was able to see like the, the wonderful life that, that happens and unfolds on campuses. Um, we were very much into supporting the, the university sports teams and international students would come to our house for Thanksgiving dinner and I got to go on sabbatical with my family and it was it was a wonderful, wonderful life. It looked like a great time. Um, but ironically, it actually didn't sink in that I wanted to pursue a career in teaching at that point. So it wasn't until I came to Japan in 1996 after graduating from my, my bachelor's degree, um, I came to Japan after graduating with a degree in theater. And the, the point was come to Japan, earn money, go home and build a theater in Canada. And uh, instead I found that having a captive audience in a classroom is, is even more wonderful. So I thought teaching is great and it actually provides a regular paycheck. So let's stick with that. Um, so then I had to go and get my master's degree to teach at the university level because I was teaching on the JET program at junior high and that didn't suit me. So I wanted to go to university, got my master's in um, teaching EFL, ESL and did part by distance from Japan and part on campus in England. Uh, and then got a job at a language center at a university and taught there for four years in Chiba. And I, I, I could see that this was the right fit as a level of, of at the stage of education. I loved teaching university, but I felt I wasn't teaching the content that really fed my passion. And so I went back to get my PhD and um, got a PhD in women's studies and media studies. And now I'm actually teaching both of those and very, very happy. Um, but going back to my dad, I, you know, in the good old days, to get yourself a tenured position, you got your PhD, and then you had to sort of follow this triad of teaching excellence, scholarly research, and community service. And by juggling these three, you didn't have to evenly spend your time in these, and it's probably impossible to do so or to consistently do so. So maybe, you know, I excel at two and uh, do the other one to the best of your ability. Um, and so that's what I, I planned for. I would finish the PhD, make sure that I'm getting good teaching reviews, uh, publish regularly if I could, and be involved on campus and off doing professional and, and service to my institution. But um, it, became, <laughs> it became very, very clear very quickly that that doesn't work anymore. Um, just having those three does not get you a permanent job. It might get you a, a nice three-year, five-year fixed-term kind of contract, but it, it's very, very challenging to find a tenure job, even if you're doing all of this stuff. Um, so uh, it took me over 15 years. I'm going to look at my script a bit here. Um, it took me over 15 years of teaching in full-time contracts at the university level holding a PhD with a published book and dozens of articles, um, chapters, yeah, journal chapters, uh, book chapters, journal articles, academic presentations, and also creating a massive uh, institutional exchange program between my institution in Japan and, uh, and my father's university in, in Canada. And still, I couldn't get I couldn't land it. <laughs> so fortunately, very, very fortunately, uh, five years ago now, five, yeah, four and a half years ago, um, after five years of job hunting, I finally got 
an interview and an offer of a tenure track position at my university, Reitaku University. And then very fortunately in the first uh, five months, they fast-tracked it and said, we want to ensure that you stay with us. And so I was granted tenure in my first year. Yay. Thank you, Ray Um, So looking back, when I, when I was asked, invited to participate in this book chapter, I thought, you know, it's really not these three things, this teaching excellence, scholarly research, and community service. That was not missing in the 15 years that I was desperately seeking tenure. So what what was it? And I believe, and this is what I decided to, to research, was that it was, it really came down to issues around my, my nationality and my gender that I felt were probably uh, complicating matters for me. And so that's what we're going to look at now. This is me standing out as a visible minority, and this is me at an international conference looking for other women scholars. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so first we're going to take a look at the foreign factor. And so here we've got a quote by, by Kate Burton and uh, looking, you can take a look at this, but the revolving door. So I'm sure a lot of, a lot of us here are familiar with that. Just the sense that the, the foreign faculty who get the fixed term contracts, you stay three to five years and then you get ushered out and somebody else comes in and takes that place. Um, so I'm going to, again, refer to my script here a bit. Um, being a foreign academic in Japan is a, a double-edged sword, uh, because on one hand, there are, um, there are positions that are automatically, you know, we're automatically qualified for some positions that they're seeking out foreign faculty, so we have that positive discrimination. Um, and in addition to this, it seems like a person's chances will improve exponentially if they are a native English speaker and may even skyrocket if they are male Caucasian and under the age of 40. Um, so in a 2017 study on the push and pull factors that influence international faculty in Japan, uh, Huang found that despite increased proportions of foreign faculty in J Japanese universities, there was no remarkable growth in the proportion of international faculty who were hired as institutional leaders, neither was there any striking rise in the proportion of female international faculty. So that very much is in line with what Kathleen was saying at the beginning about, you know, the number of foreign faculty may grow a bit, but it's not showing a change in positions of leadership occupied by foreign faculty and the numbers of female foreign faculty um, at both part-time and full-time is quite minuscule. So considering that Huang um, also noted that as of 2016, full-time international faculty made up less than 5% of the full-time post-secondary Japanese workforce, and that male international faculty outnumber female international faculty by nearly four to one, it is quite apparent that the foreign faculty presence in Japan is still very small and especially so for foreign female faculty members. And yet, and yet, uh, if we look at this, you know, this is internationalization and globalization PR jargon. Um, this is still a very hot topic in Japan for Japanese universities. And these terms are firmly entrenched in post-secondary PR jargon. Uh, one only needs to skim through some of these initiative titles. Uh, you see, definitely these terms resonate. Uh, so yeah, I've highlighted all the globals and the worldwides. And my personal favorite is the Waseda one. Waseda goes global, a plan to build a worldwide academic network that is open, dynamic, and diverse. It's quite a mouthful. Um, and accordingly, with this sort of you know jargon in, in uh, common usage, Japanese universities seem duty bound to offer prospective students a global campus, uh, ready access to cross-cultural communication with international students and faculty, and myriad opportunities for study abroad and homestay programs. For many foreign faculty members, this focus on international activity presents the opportunity to shine. And as, Jap as Japan's population dwindles and its universities battle for survival, we can only wait and see if our foreignness stock will rise in this period of educational upheaval. In truth, the number of Japanese post-secondary institutions is already unsustainable, as we all know, 
Uh, so universities are now scrambling to reorganize and rebrand their programs in order to attract both Japanese and international students. These efforts can be seen in the promotion of global campuses and in the popularity of uh, things, these recruitment activities like Yume Navi, which you may be familiar with, where six to 8,000 high school students will go to places like the Tokyo Big Site to see representative faculty speak on behalf of the university for these enormous recruitment days. Uh, and I did that for my university in 2018. And I assume the strategy is that we will stand out at the Tokyo Big Site if we have a foreign faculty member that is speaking. Um, so while departments and programs restructure in these challenging days, there may indeed be potential for international faculty to take on larger roles in the way post-secondary education is designed and delivered in Japan. Uh, now, I wrote this a year ago, and now it is such a different situation because uh, all, of our, all of our exchange programs and partnerships are kind of up in the air in COVID times. And so it makes me wonder uh, if instead of the shrinking population sort of having us positioned in a, a, a good place for the foreign faculty to take on a leadership role in the universities, if we may no longer be quite as useful and desirable. So that's something we could think about later. Um, moving along though, looking at the female factor, um, and here we have uh, some information from Stephanie Asman. Let me take a look at that. Um, while being a foreign academic has its advantages and disadvantages in Japan, being a female academic has long been perceived overwhelmingly to be a handicap. Uh, as noted in the quote above, the percentage of female researchers in Japanese research intensive universities barely surpasses the 10% mark. Two significant reasons which account for the difficulties faced by women in Japanese academia can be linked to long held conceptions of the expert being constructed as male. And with the continued social expectation that women should shoulder the lion's share of domestic work and childcare. The notion in Japan that scholarship has traditionally been seen as the domain of men can be traced through the decline of female educators in each stage of education uh, from primary through post-secondary. As Asman observes on the scarcity of female Japanese teachers in higher education, while 62% of elementary school teachers are female, only 30.3% of teachers at high schools and 19.5% of university faculties consist of female lecturers, associate or full professors. So at every stage of the educational process, women are disappearing. All right. Now I'm throwing a lot of numbers and charts at you. So to recap, uh, Asman found that Japanese female academics hold less than 20% of university faculty positions in Japan and only 12.7% of research positions. And revisiting Huang's study, we can see that of the 5% of international academics working in Japan who have succeeded in securing full-time posts, foreign male faculty outnumber foreign female faculty nearly four to one, leaving foreign female academics holding less than 2% of permanent posts in Japanese universities. So less than 2%. So, so these, all of us speakers on this panel, we, we are, we make up part of that 1.6 or 7% of permanent uh, female faculty members in Japan. It is a very rare find for sure. Um, so in my own case, I have found that um, my gender seemed to be less problematic. I, I believe it was like foreign um, identity, but in a sense, you know, it always seemed to me that my foreignness trumped my femaleness so that I was just foreign academic. I was gender free. Um, but I don't know, I, I, writing this article also made me question that idea as well. And I thank my editors for pointing that out. Um, so I also acknowledge that, you know, I, I am a child free unmarried person and that excuses me from some of those extra responsibilities that my, my married with kids and single uh, parent colleagues are faced with. Um, but I do acknowledge that, you know, in those five years that I was waiting to get interviews and 
to get positions, uh, perhaps my gender was working against me because maybe I didn't have those connections inside the institutions where somebody was saying, hey, interview my mate, you know? And I don't know, I, I can't know, but I wonder now. Um, so, so maybe, maybe gender was just as problematic as my foreignness. Um, okay, now off script. Uh, so these are my insider tips, the concluding part. Um, and I did this last year and I will do it again now that um, I, I can genuinely say, and I said it in my book too, that I don't know if I would do it all again if I went back 20 years. I don't know if I'd come to Japan. I don't know if I would pursue a PhD. Um, I, I really struggled a lot through this process. And the, the amount of years, well, the amount of years you put into your education, the amount of money, the amount of, of blood, sweat, and tears, and then having been told that once you have that triad that you're going to be able to get yourself onto a tenure, tenure stream at least position, and then having to wait another 15, 16 years, it really took a toll like on my confidence, on, on my health. Um, and I think that there's a lot of struggles um, that all of us are going through probably quite silently. Um, so yeah, it's, it's arduous and I don't know if I would recommend to, to anybody pursuing a humanities or social science um, graduate program whether or not this is the right move right now. So I, I think that they should at least seek out advice on whether there's jobs in their field uh, that seem to be opening up uh, and, that, and that also that their training hopefully will be applicable to other things uh, because yeah, there, there might not be a whole lot of full-time tenure jobs in the future. But if you are still, if you are still motivated and you want to do this, because frankly, once you can do it, it's really great. Um, but if, if you want to pursue this, these are my tips. Um, find mentors who, who will champion you. So important. Um, especially here in Japan, they, there's a lot of behind doors uh, negotiating for which, which departments and programs will get the funding for a permanent spot. Uh, you need people who are going to champion you, who are going to fight for you. So make sure that you have those people on your side. Um, also, get active in professional development circles like JOLT, because uh, that's where you're going to you're going to hear about the jobs that maybe are not being advertised, and you're going to have people who say, "Hey, you know, this person would be great for my school." So you. You're, you are, of course, going to learn things and you can contribute things, but it's also connections, you know? So yeah, get out there and, and uh, mingle. Um, number three, make an effort to learn Japanese. This one, I, I definitely get low points on. Um, because I did my, uh, the majority of my master's and my PhD while working full-time, I wasn't able to devote as much time to language study as I would have liked. Um, now that I am faced with copious amounts of Japanese email and paperwork, I so desperately wish that I had more fluency. Um, so it's just, I assure you, it's a good investment of your time. Um, and also just for communication, being able to communicate better with colleagues. I think I'm very fortunate that I have a lot of colleagues that can speak with me in English and we, we get by, but I think, I think it's a good, a good thing to do if you have the opportunity. Um, and so finally, devote time to self-care, because as I said earlier, it's, it, it can be a bumpy road and it can be very, very hard on you. And so it's important to remind yourself that, you know, you are good and there's not a whole lot of jobs, but that's not a reflection on, you know, how capable and competent you are. Um, talk to your friends and go go out and remind yourself of how beautiful the country is. Take a road trip because uh, there can be days where it, it, gets, it gets a bit heavy. So take time for self-care. And since the presentation was waiting with bated breath, don't forget to breathe. So that is uh, all from me. I'm happy to share my references in any of these slides with you uh, later. And I look forward to feedback and questions in Q&A. Thank you very much.
Um, let's get back. I assume everybody's back and seated and with a fresh pot of popcorn and we're ready to go. And so, so shall I hand over to you, Louise? Yeah, for Louise, sure. Great. Thanks. Right. Uh, hang on. I'm going to, I'm going to need to stop sharing that screen and I think, I think you've got it. Okay. Thank you so much for having me along today. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, this book chapter was the first narrative I've written, and today this will be the first presentation I do without slides. Today I'd like to just tell you a story, just from me to you, and uh, it's a story of how I got involved in JELT. Um, let's rewind to 2010, because uh, that was when I had an interview for a job that I got in Tokyo, and it was one of my first jobs as a part-time teacher. At the interview, I was talking with one of the professors about some um, kind of projects I'd been doing with my students using blogs to help them to start learning English outside of class and using it as a communicative, communicative tool outside of class. And um, after I got the job, she contacted me and said she was really interested in what I'd been doing. And she asked if I'd like to do a joint project using my blog idea. Um, and have our students uh, do that blogging project and for us to collect data and share it at JELT 2011. And I had um, known about JELT for a while and I was kind of a paper member. I read the TLT um, and the JELT journal, but I had, had no personal involvement with the organization at all. And so I went along to JELT 2011 and I have to tell you, I found it a really um, engaging experience. I didn't quite know where I fit in. At the time, um, my daughter was still breastfeeding and um, actually maybe she'd just been weaned, but she was still pretty tiny. And so even going, I just went for one day, the day of the presentation, I was working part-time um, at three different universities uh, doing kind of half day shifts to help myself kind of manage my parenting as well as my teaching. And um, when I went there, I just didn't really know how to manage the schedule, how to find other people that I could talk with, how to um, even get my projector for the place I was supposed to be presenting, how, how to get the projector into the room. So I missed the plenary session because uh, I remember that the, the tech crew uh, just didn't have things there at, at the beginning of the day. And I was so nervous that I was waiting for it instead of trusting that it would be there like I should have done. I was like, wow, there's no projector, what's gonna happen? And uh, I was really nervous, but I went along and I did the session. And I didn't understand that there were social events like Best of Jelt that I could go along to and meet other people or whatever social events that the, the conference has now that are held by SIGs and that type of thing. So I kind of went, did my session, saw a few other sessions and went home. And I didn't go back to anything um, JELT related until 2015. So I took a four year break <laughs> from JELT. And uh, so my second, that, that um, professor who invited me to do research with her, she was my, the first person on my JELT journey. The second one was a coworker when I got my first uh, full-time job. And she was really into ed tech and her and I started going to uh, I4 conferences. There was a conference called the Asian Conference on te Technology in the Classroom, ACTC. And uh, we went over to Osaka for that. And uh, it was a much, much smaller conference than JELT 2011. And I felt really comfortable there, had a lot of chance to talk with people. And her and I started going to some things together. Like we went to ETJ in Tokyo and did a joint presentation. And uh, eventually in Fukuoka, no less, uh, there was the, um, a JELT call conference and we went to that. And while I was there, I, I should say, I met my tribe. Yeah, I really got along with the JELT call people right from the start. Um, and I was, uh, asked by another person who was there, the third person I would say on the journey into JELT. Um, one of the officers suggested that I become a member at large. 
And so I had no idea what a member at large was. I mean, when, when I hear the words at large, I sound, it makes me think somebody's a criminal and that they're running away from the cops. But um, apparently it meant that you are a general helper of the officers. So I decided, okay, I'll do that. And I went to the elections and I became a member at large. And after that, I started participating in something, I think it was teamwork. It was an online platform. Now, nowadays we use Slack, um, but it was some kind of online platform and all of the offices were in there and there were lots of threads about different topics. And I just watched for a while as the other officers were typing about different things that they were doing. And I, I could see the general banter between people. Um, and I, I waited until there was an opportunity for me to be able to actually contribute something. And uh, we had started preparing for the next conference. And so I decided to volunteer to do publicity for the, for the conference um, and help with editing the handbook and basically checking the website updates as they were being prepared and all of those kind of little behind the scenes things. And that got me more involved with Jolt Call. Fast forward a little bit further, uh, not that much further though, because it was 2015 when I started volunteering for Jolt Call. Uh, from November 2016, I took on a role uh, on the board of directors. And that was because the, um, the person who was stepping down from the director of program position at the time, he asked me if I would be interested in taking on his position. He wanted to nominate me for it. I had gotten to know him through going to IFOR conferences for a number of years. And I knew of the kind of work that he was doing through IFOR. Didn't know much about Jolt at all, but he told me lots of positive things about it. He didn't lie. He said it was going to be very challenging, time consuming, that um, I would struggle sometimes to balance things, but he said it would also be very rewarding and that I'd have a chance to institute change within the organization. One of the reasons that he pushed me was that he thought that more female voices were needed on the board of directors. And uh, I thought about it very briefly, actually. I agreed that night <laughs> and I didn't understand the process in JELT. He said, oh, there'll be elec an election. I'm like, well, I'm not campaigning. I didn't realize that generally only one person raises their hand and then gets voted in <laughs> when it comes to these heavy workload jobs that you have to do um, in the BOD or that kind of thing. So I decided to do it. Now, as I was doing all of these things, I was managing other roles myself. So I told you that in 2011, I went to JELT National for the first time uh, in 29, I was wrapping up my master's of education and I was working as a researcher for the first time to start publishing. And then in 2010, I had my daughter um, and she's 10 years old now. And in 2013, I started doing my PhD. So by the time I got to the board of directors in November, 2016, um, I was a mom. I was working full time. I was doing my PhD. I was volunteering for Jelt Call. And um, was there anything else? <laughs> yeah, that was basically it, I think. I was still doing side research projects on top of the PhD. Um, so I was pretty stretched. And at the time I was thinking when I took on the job on the board of directors that I was going to drop Jelt Call. But I couldn't do it. And the reason I couldn't do it is because I felt really upset with the imbalance of male and female um, participation. Um, in 2018, in May, when I was researching just some background figures for my chapter, uh, at the time, JELP membership had 59% male and 41% female, but JELP call had 78% male and 22% female. And there were 18 SIG officers, including myself, only three were women. And so I really wanted to stay because I wanted there to be female presence. And uh, so I told myself, 
for the first six months when I'm on the board of directors, I'll just juggle both of these things. And then when we get to the next um, annual general meeting, which we have uh, at our conference every June, when I make it to June, then I'll drop it and I'll pass it on. But when I got to the next June, I still didn't feel satisfied. Like I didn't feel like we'd got enough women involved. So I stayed on for another term and I just kept balancing things. Uh, and I'm really, really happy to say that now, just looking at figures, uh, I actually want to screen share with you. Um, this is how we're doing now. So you can see here, there are 11 different positions and actually six of them are held by females and five of them are held by males. These are our main officer positions. When Jelk Cole started archiving their um, lists of officers back in 2011, there were actually no female officers and uh, it had gotten up to three by the time that I was part of the team uh, in 2015. And now we have um, a lot more because we also have the members at large down the bottom. We have another two female um, officers there. So now we have eight. So I'm feeling like we have more female presence within our SIG and I'm very, very pleased about that. How did this happen? Well, it was a concerted effort, a concerted effort to make sure that we have um, female plenary speakers each time so that when women look at the Jelk Call website or the PR, they don't just see men only in the pictures that we're putting out when we're promoting the conference. Um, and sometimes I had to fight for that and I'm pretty damn noisy. So uh, in the end, <laughs> we, we pretty much had female speakers. Um, and sometimes we've had an issue with somebody needing to pull out at the last minute, um, like a health issue. And so things haven't worked out in that particular year, but we've been really pushing to have that. Uh, and you can see actually, we've done the same thing with um, Jelt. Here we are with JALT 2020. Uh, at the bottom, you can see we've got the Eve 2020 for JALT 2020, which means that we have equal voices um, and we have a balance between male and female speakers. So this is something that I've been looking for within JALT Call um, and within JALT International Conferences um, as a priority uh, to push. One of the ways that we got females involved in addition to having visible female presence was talking to women and telling them about the positions and inviting them and making them feel like we want them to be part of it. So some of the women that you could see as officers, if you go to our site, are people who other officers, existing officers made an effort to reach out to before the AGMs, before the annual general meetings, told them a bit about the background, uh, talked to them about um, options for job sharing, for example, or how much of a workload there is. Um, actually, myself and Erin Noxon are job sharing two roles at the moment because she took on the role of program chair. Um, I had been involved as publicity officer with the the kinds of things that the program chair was doing because I was always dealing with that information to promote it. So I was helping her a little when she came in as program chair and she got a bit interested in publicity as well. So this year we both decided we'd do both the roles and split them so that we are, we are managing those. And it works out well because if there are times when I'm really busy, I can rely on her and the opposite. So. Uh, maybe that's something for SIGs and chapters to think about when they can, um, where they can lower barriers for people to get involved with taking on roles within SIGs. Um, I think that the other thing that I would say that has helped with um, participation is that uh, when I was on the board of directors, I wanted to make gel, um JALT international events, a place where parents felt that they could go. And so I instigated a, um, a system whereby guardians and children could come in with a waiver. And uh, so they needed to provide their names to JALT central office because we have insurance at our events when they're face to face. Uh, but they would be given a special family pass. And I took my daughter um, 
as a actually that that year it was in scuba and there, there wasn't any big need for my husband and daughter to come along but I thought it was very symbolic and my daughter and husband could go see the rockets <laughs> because there's a space station up the road a space museum uh, so my husband and daughter came along to support me and um, I made an effort to be visible so that other parents might feel that they could do it too and I think that's one of the jobs that I take on within gel it's that I have a very very supportive family and I have a lot of um, I, my my husband's mom lives very close by so in terms of childcare, when my husband and I are both busy she's available my husband's very very involved as much as I am with our daughter uh, so when I need to focus on things like work, like my PhD, those kinds of things, I can do that. I know that not everybody's in that position, but I can do that. So when I have the time available to be able to go to a conference and show people, yes, you can bring your kid if you want, do it. I do that because I think that we need women to lead by example. Um, and if there are women who are in a position to do it, they should do it. I feel like I feel obliged, like I, like I should do it. Um, and there was a person who, um, came to the conference that year, the first year that we instigated it, that we, that we introduced this system. And she said, she's a single mom and, uh, she'd been wondering about how she was going to be able to go to the conference. And she came up to me at the conference and she said, thank you. You know, you. I could bring my kid because I knew that it was okay to bring my kid and her kid and mine played uh, in front of the plenary's stage for the JJ session with some Lego that her kid had brought along. And I thought, yeah, this is the way it should be. We shouldn't be pushing people out of professional development. We should be making space for them. Um, so I've endeavored to do that. And I know that parent, you know, the, the role of being a parent's not just listed to females because obviously um, there, there are men who have kids too. So I don't want to say this was only done for women. And in fact, the comments that I received on the Facebook post about the family pass, uh, there were comments from men as well, obviously. Um, so it's, it's not just about only promoting women. Uh, but I came from the perspective of a mother and I wondered what I could do to help other mothers, other parents, uh, have more involvement. Yeah. Um, so I think if I were to give some advice uh, to people, the people who are here today, if you want other people to be involved, reach out. For me, those four people that I told you about in my journey, the professor who interviewed me for the part-time job, the colleague who said, let's go to Osaka for this tech-based conference, um, the, uh, the person who said to me at the JELT, call conference, why don't you be a member at large? And the person who said, well, how about joining the board of directors? Without those four people, I hadn't even considered doing those things. So we have to be conscious that some people don't consider doing this. It's not that they don't want to, it's just it hasn't occurred to them or they've never thought that they would be good enough, qualified enough, that they'd have enough to bring to the table. If we can reach out to them, then uh, we might find that we do get more involvement. And the other thing is that if you don't have anyone reaching out to you, but you want to be involved, well, you have to be a little bit brave and uh, you have to start a conversation with somebody. Start the, start the conversation by asking a question. Um, talk to somebody who you know um, and, and, uh, or who you've seen in one of the gel Facebook groups, for example, um, or somebody who's here today, chat in the chat box here. Um, because it's a great opportunity. And I think that, you know, with JELT 2020 this year, we're focusing on communities of teachers and learners. And uh, this was a theme that I was involved with, you know, choosing for this year. And one of the reasons I chose it is because I think that our greatest strength um, within JELT and within this field is that we build on each other, we bring each other up, we, uh, we support each other. And I, I really hope that not only at the conference this year, but, you know, throughout the year that we continue doing that and find new ways to do that. So that's my journey. And that's what I wanted to share with you today.